Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. Every week we come together with the intention of presenting topics on theology and ministry and church history, many, many different things uh, that are intended to edify you and strengthen you. And not too long ago, uh, we did an episode on the topic of angelology, which is that part of theology that deals with the topic of angels and how they're portrayed in Scripture. This week, we're going to be doing an episode devoted to demonology, which is the theology devoted to the study of, of fallen angels and the demonic host that is associated with the devil, Lucifer, and his army uh, of wicked. So now, many of you already probably know uh, that in Scripture we have three enemies. We have the world's system that has been established by the devil uh, that's intended to create downfall for mankind. So it's a systemic and a systematic approach to causing people uh, to tend towards temptation. We have our flesh, which is the natural part of us that was born into sin. And despite the fact that we're saved, we still struggle with our flesh. And so our fleshly nature, our carnal nature, tends towards sin. It is also an enemy. But then we have this, uh, this ultimate being, the devil and his devils, that are constantly working against us uh, to see mankind turn from Christ, uh, turn worshipers away from God, and ultimately uh, serve our sin nature. So today we're going to be talking about the devil and his host of uh, devils, demons, and uh, this is this is kind of a this is kind of a uh, a tricky topic because so many people in our world today uh, want to dismiss this part of scripture as superstitious. And so, uh, for this conversation, I've invited uh, the most trusted pastor I have in my life, and that is Pastor Sam Miles, who is the president of LFBI and he is the pastor here at Midtown Baptist Temple, to address this topic. And so with that, Pastor Sam Miles. Hey. So a lot of people who listen to this show, they're familiar with our view uh, on the fall of Luc Lucifer. We've, we've talked about this in our episodes on Genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this in the episode on angelology, which, which you were here for. Uh, we talked about the fall of Lucifer and, and his host of angels. But just by way of recap, I think it's going to be beneficial for us to kind of look at that again. Could you explain to us what the, the fall of the, the angels was like and what that means and, and how were the, how did the devils come to be? If we're reviewing, you'll remember from Genesis, uh, the Genesis interviews, um, that Genesis 1-1 creation, that would have been under... Luciferian stewardship. Mm -hmm. You know, here's Lucifer, um, the anointed cherub that covers, you know. Uh, he, he, the Bible very clearly described him as the, you know, just the pinnacle of creation. You know, in, in Ezekiel 28, you see him described, you know, he seals up the psalm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> He's perfect in wisdom. He's 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 absolutely beautiful, and and um, you know, and so you, you you see his glory, you see his authority. Uh, literally, he's the first of all created beings. You know, he's the first of all creation, and so he he was the head of the angelic class, and 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 so you've got, um, it, you know, with his fall, you know, this orchestrates. A, a mass rebellion with within the celestial host. You mm -hmm. know, like for example, Revelation chapter twelve, in verses three and four, the Bible says that you know, describing this wonder in heaven, uh, it, it goes like this: Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And, and if you keep going in Revelation verse nine, it very clearly reveals this dragon is Satan. It's the, mm -hmm. you know, the devil, it's, it's Satan, it's the serpent. And, and verse four says he drew, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and it cast them to the earth. And so what that, what that tells me is, you know, when the sum is all counted, when it's all said and done, fully one third of the celestial hosts will have fallen Satan in his rebellion. You know, mm -hmm. those stars, you see those stars of heaven 
these are at celestial, angelic beings. Um, the, the, they're, the, they're the sons of God, the, the stars of heaven uh, described in Job. You know, in Job mm-hmm. 1, the sons of God present themselves before the Lord. See it again in Job 2. And so these angels created by God, Hebrew says they're ministering spirits. So they all serve at God's pleasure mm-hmm. until that Isaiah 14 moment where Satan, the pinnacle of creation, um, built to lead worship. <laughs> you know, he, his, he's got perfect pitch. <laughs> he's the perfect worship leader. Right. Uh, he's beautiful. He's every precious stone is his covering. And so he's reflecting and refracting our God who is light. Mm-hmm. the throne of God. And, and so he's leading all of creation in worship. And the way I always put it, all of creation is look, worshiping God, but looking at him. And, and so we got to pray for our worship leaders. But, you know, at some point in Isaiah 14, we see those five I wills. And that's where he, I mean, literally, he births this spirit of antichrist. You know, in the beginning, it's God. In the beginning, God created the heaven yeah. and the earth. And John tells us, in the beginning was the word. And we find out the Word was with God, the Word was God. And everything that we see in Genesis chapter 1 is Jesus saying, let it be, and it was. Yeah. So he's the fount. Jesus is the fount of creation. And all of creation serves at his pleasure. It's just over and over, he's giving commands. And creation obeys. And so here is Satan in Isaiah 14 standing in the place of God as God showing himself that he is God. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, in Isaiah in Isaiah fourteen, um, you know he's going to ascend to the heights of heaven, and God says, "No, you'll be brought down to the pit, to the mm-hmm. to, to the lowest hell." You know, I mean, that's the ultimate end game for Satan. Once God's wrath, once Christ's judgment is final, he will spend eternity in a lake of fire. Why? Because creation rebelled, mm-hmm. and it started in Satan's heart. You know. Yeah. He, he failed to function as a ministering spirit. Creation rebels and, and stands in the place of God as God. He's determined to show himself as God. And so that's, you know, that's it. For whatever reason, that is the decision for creation. Is it Christ or Antichrist? Is it Christ or is it me? Right. And, um, you know, so yeah, he, he rebelled and, and that was obviously attractive to at least one third of the heavenly host, right. and, and they follow him in that rebellion. So, yeah. th- and obviously the contention between God and Satan continues on throughout the entirety of Scripture until the resolution yeah. in, in Revelation. Yeah. But um, there's a difference between the, the biblical perspective of that contention, good and evil, versus like other false religions uh, that have some form of like, you know, it's sometimes referred to as chaos conf. Or you know, uh, f- views of 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 chaos between a good and an evil energy, right? What distinguishes the narrative of Scripture and the way that God and Satan relate to one another? What distinguishes it that yeah. from the perspectives of all these other false Babylonian yeah. religions, yeah. if you will? Yeah, yeah, or like in the Eastern. Religious, you know, there's no yin and yang. Right. It's not a yin, yin and yang uh, construct. There's no, like, the the biblical view or the biblical presentation isn't some balance of powers. Right. <laughs> yeah. Know? They're not like lords of opposing realms. And, you know, every time I think of, you know, I think of these Greek gods and their realms, you know, oh, I just yeah. get James Woods in my head right. with his blue fire hair, you know, for hair. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's this power struggle sure. between brothers, which would be, you know, kind of like how, you know, a typical Mormon might view it. And like, it, it's it's not in that, it's not, it's not defined in that construct. It's no, it's pure rebellion on Satan's yeah. part. Like we said before, creation rebels against the creator. And so. So we're not supposed to have empathy for him. Well, <laughs> people I mean, because, do because yeah, they follow him, right. you know? Yeah, for sure. Historically, you see that's like part of the great lie, right? People yeah. have empathy for Lucifer because he's, you know, he's the guy that 
he's Prometheus. Mm-hmm. You know, he brought fire to mankind and he got a bad rap for it. And, right. and uh, the Jesus figures of all creation myths uh, hate him yeah. for elevating hum- humanity beyond its savage place Mm -hmm. you know it's uncultured or uncivilized station and and because he let the cat out of the bag and he's the bringer of knowledge and light and wisdom and beauty you know he he brought the humanities to humanity and and so you know the 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 way the lost world will view it uh these guys who who all you know we're talking rank and file mystery religion adherents these Mm -hmm. deists right they all think that Lucifer got a bad rap. He's really the architect uh, of, of humanity. Yeah. He's the one that's for humanity. And and so, you know, in their construct, the Jesus character uh, has an ax to grind against his brother, the Lucifer character. And, and uh, really, we need to be rooting for him. He's the underdog, and he's the one that's actually going to help us the most mm-hmm. as humanity. And so, again, it's just part of that whole mystery, religion, spirit right. of Antichrist mentality. It, it's all about usurping Christ. No, it's pure rebellion on Satan's part, a slating for destruction on God's part, and then humanity— all right, we get to exercise our free will and pick for ourselves which side of the division we're going to. I mean, it's actually a pretty brilliant yeah. construct how God could take one entity, one being's rebellion, and make that the dividing line for all of the rest of creation. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve, and and so much of humanity is just like Israel of old. We're just sitting on the. We won't answer a word. We're just kind of sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. You know, is there validity to the to the offer in terms of the spirit of Antichrist to stand in the place of God as God, showing yourself you are God? Eve thought so. Adam chose so. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just see it repeating throughout all of history. You get to 1 Kings 18, they won't say. Well, right. silence is assent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, man, when the fire falls, when the judgment falls, right? When the fire falls, what's the obvious response? The Lord, he is the God. Right. The Lord, Jehovah, he is the God, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, 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 yeah, it's not a, it's not a yin. I, maybe that's the best way to put it. Yeah. It's not a yin and yang construct. No. no, it's a point of, of rebellion and division that God uses to paint a line across all of creation. Choose you this day whom yeah. you will serve. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So, well, let's talk specifically then about the characters at play here. We have the devil, right? That's how we refer to him today, the devil. Mm-hmm. And we have his devils, right? The demon, demonic host uh, that follow him. Uh, can you explain to us who they are and what their relation to one another is? So in terms of the devils, you know, what are the, what are the categories? What are the classifications? What are the relationship to the capital T, capital D, the yeah. devil? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And uh, it is... Interesting. I, I just did a quick refresher and, and just double checked my strongest definitions. You know, in Le- Leviticus 17 7, it says, And they, the they is God's people, Israel in this case, they shall no more offer their sacrifice unto devils after whom they have gone a whoring. So there, that word that's translated devil, that's the one that's the shaggy he goat. The stereotypical depiction of the devil with the horns right. and the hooves, and okay, uh, so the, the so anytime you see that word translated devils, we're talking about these Ephesian six principalities and powers, these spiritual beings mm-hmm. that have rebelled against the Lord. Then in Deuteronomy thirty two seventeen, you've got another word translated devils. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers served not. Okay, so this would this would be like the um, the uh, Genesis six uh, um, stereotypical um, deities, the entities of the of the creation myths of the nations of the world so you know you know uh, zeus and right and uh the descendants you've got all these mighty men of renown hercules you know i mean it's this it's these gods saturn mercury you know right. venus so these are these are the newbies right mm-hmm. they sacrificed unto devils the bible says not to god gods whom they knew not 
to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers fear not. And so this would be a, a Genesis 6 reference. And the word that's translated devils there is the word that we would use for demon. Mm. And a demon, okay, a demon um, really at the root of the, of the word demon or the definition demon is a devastator, right? This is, this is, this is someone whose goal is destruction mm -hmm. uh, for a human or for humanity. These are devastators. The, these are, and it's translated here, devils. Okay, so they're, they're evil spirits with the goal of just only creating destruction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got, you've got in both cases... They're desiring sacrifice that belongs to. They're standing in the place right. of God as God, showing themselves. Jesus is no better than them, right. <laughs> you know. Then in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter four and verse one, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and we know that that's Lucifer himself, right? And the Strong's word there would be a Satan, you know, the false accuser, uh, the slanderer, the devil. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, then 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. So there are, there are spirits with a message that's very attractive, but it's really a lie. And doctrines of devils. There are devils who have THDs, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they graduate from the best right. Bible schools, and, and they warp what the message of the Bible actually says. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... The Strong's word translated devils there talks about a, 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 a demonic being, but a deity, right? Mm -hmm. A demonic deity. So again, we're back to that Ephesians 6 construct where, you know, devils can fall into that category of principalities, powers, uh, these rulers in high places. So part of the celestial host that fell in their rebellion against God, mm -hmm. right? That they could be a devil. First Corinthians 10, 20 gives that other aspect of what a devil, what can be classified as a devil. First Corinthians 10, 20 says, but I say that these things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. And the word that's translated as devils there would be demon again, mm -hmm. right? This this idea of a disembodied spirit that desires to stand in God's place in the life of humanity. And so um, what do you have? You've got the devil and you have with him other celestial beings, angelic beings, these sons of God who rebel against the Father. They, re re they rebel against the Lord Jesus Christ. So they can function in the capacity of deific beings, these deities, yeah. and they desire worship. But then you've got these evil spirits that do the same. Yeah. They follow in those in that same pattern. Um, you know, Matthew talks about a disembodied spirit that wants to be embodied. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't like wandering dry, dry places. He wants to wear flesh. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I want to come back to that because there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a unique relationship that exists even just within that conversation. But we've but we've identified the devil, the devils, and then this this function of spirits and this this that kind are of creates, in alignment. Right, that are yeah. in alignment. And they're kind yeah. of like a triune, you know, functioning yeah. force in this world. Yeah. And and so I want to come back to familiar spirits because I think it's a really unique topic topic and, and it's worth addressing because it does create a lot of confusion for people. By the way, whenever you say they're functioning in this world. You know, one of the sobering, I think, it's really sobering reality is, is we're vastly outnumbered. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible describing the celestial hosts, you know, the angelic beings, describes them um, as innumerable. And if Satan takes one-third of an innumerable company, one-third still innumerable. Yeah. <laughs> and we know that there's still not eight billion people on the planet because right. they keep counting them. Right. You know, we're, we're outnumbered. Yeah. Yeah. And then you add to that these evil spirits, these demons. Oh, man. He's got foot soldiers. Yeah. And so, you know, with that in mind, I, I think you mentioned something that I, I, I've always been really fascinated by. Mm -hmm. And um, and, I, and I want you to maybe just explain it to the listeners a little bit, is this idea of the principalities part. 
And especially going back to that Deuteronomy passage that you referenced. So what does it look like for devils to have high places? I mean, because it implies government, it implies nations, it implies rulership, and it incorporates the idea of idolatry. And so when you think about, you know, Mm -hmm. in in the ancient world, uh, when, you know, in the early birth of the nation of Israel, you have a nation of people that are set apart as God's nation. But the remainder of the nations, the Gentile nations, well, they fall out really, in many regards, as as enemy territory. Mm -hmm. And then they establish these false idols over themselves. Uh, What is the relationship? They each have their own deity that they're they're worshiping. And they're different characters Mm -hmm. with with specific narratives. And I and I wonder how much of this is theoretical and how much of it is 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 given to us literally in scripture. Mm-hmm. But but are those rulers, are those gods, like are they literally devils? And if so, how what kind of power did they exercise over the people, particularly in ancient times? Well, we know it's literal yeah. because the Bible literally describes them. Right, <laughs> you right. know, like for example, Michael is Israel's prince. So in terms mm-hmm. of principalities over in high places that have some effect, right? There's some rule that they have that affects the outcome for the people in those nations. Right. So like in Daniel's case, how long until, you, you know, I mean, we get it. Israel rebelled. They were warned. They didn't respond right to the prophets. It was poor response. Mm-hmm. God sends judgment. Okay, so we're in captivity. How long until everything's been fulfilled? You know, how long till there's a restoration and and he's praying and, and the answer doesn't come. And when the response finally comes, you know, Gabriel comes to bring a message. Um, what was the cause of the delay? You know, why did it why did it take weeks? Well, because the Prince of Persia, yeah, he's withstanding the message going to uh, a, a prophet for the nation of Israel. Right. Uh, so to keep that message, that, that calm from getting out to humanity, you've got a resistance in high places taking place until Michael, Israel's prince, mm-hmm. a principality over the nation of Israel comes and sets it straight. And now the message can be delivered. And so like for Babylon, it's Moloch, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, what's his Murdoch. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And, and so you'll see, you'll see uh, hints. Well, all of the nations tell their own story. And, and so they, you know, in, in all of these, the, mm-hmm. you know, scholars call them creation myths, you get the names sure. of the gods, the principalities over these, over these nations and these people groups. And I think, you know, absent having other data, you just take it literally. Yeah. We actually have a lot of these names, Jupiter. Sure. You know. And by literally, I guess I mean even in framing what that means. Was there literal, in some regards, was there literal governorship? Was there a throne where a devil sat on it? They inter- did they interact directly with people? Like, yeah. It's there's a there's a your imagination runs wild here. Yeah. Because clearly Michael interacts with the nation of Israel, but it's a limited relationship. In other yeah. words, there's an invisible work. Yeah. He in many regards, he appears when he needs to. Yeah. Um. It just makes me curious about the nature of the oversight. Was it was it purely spiritual, uh, the way that we see it even described for us in the New Testament in terms of what, were the devils basically functioning as manipulating powers over rulers? Is that what it means when it says that they, you know, they these were kings and yeah. So beyond what the Bible says, it's all speculation. Yeah. Right. Right. So this would be. This would be my two cents on it. Yeah. Um, yes, they have thrones. They have a dominion. Mm-hmm. They have spiritual, tactical, actual authority over these, you know, and I think it's going to fall along the lines of Genesis chapter 10, the, the families of the earth. There are spiritual principalities that have governmental impact over the course right. of their lives. Right. And what that looks like in the day-to-day tactical, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's all it, it's hard to get emphatic over things that the Bible isn't explicit. Right. Isn't explicitly saying. However, I think we get a huge clue in Ephesians chapter six after we get done hearing how people need to treat each other in Ephesians six, it wraps up with 
employee, employer relationship, servants mm-hmm. and masters. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. P- wear his word. It will protect you, right? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So we've got God with his warriors, his armies. So in terms of a, you know, we're not in a we're not in a physical kingdom paradigm at this mm-hmm. point. In the church age, we've already been through the Acts of the Apostles. We've transitioned from a, a kingdom of heaven offering into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, right? Right. The kingdom of God dwells in you. Right. It, it comes to pass when God dwells in the heart of the believer by faith. And so what we're doing is we're taking kingdom territory, right? You, you know, we talk a lot, especially in the Living Faith Fellowship, we talk a lot about uh, the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. Well, there's another kingdom that the Bible very clearly lays out, and it's called mm-hmm. the kingdoms of this world, over which they have a God. Yeah. And his name is Lucifer. And, right. you know, Paul told the church at Corinth, uh, the devil is the God of this world. It's a little G God, but with Adam's fall, a stewardship fails. And de facto, right, in terms of spiritual authority, Adam loses his standing as the son of God. Luke chapter three, you get that that genealogy of Jesus and you run it right all the way back to Adam, and it calls him as a direct created being of God. He is the Son of God. Mm-hmm. So he loses his 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 spiritual standing as an authority, as 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 the well as the steward of the dispensation of innocence. Yes, yeah, his dominion is gone. Yeah, and Satan by default becomes the god of this world. In Matthew chapter four, you've got forty days of of fasting which would kill most people. Yeah. He's literally at the end of his rope physically. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is is like right there at death's door. Mm-hmm. And Satan comes and tries to tempt him three different ways and the big one more than stones being turned to bread. Like that might have been the one that got me. Yeah, right. <laughs> if I can make stones bread after 40 days. Right. <laughs> But no, the, the the cherry on top of the temptation is he shows him all of the kingdoms right, of the world in a, in a moment in time and offers them to the Lord. What well, you read Revelation and you find out Jesus is going to take those kingdoms. Right. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord Jesus Christ mm-hmm. in Revelation. That's the cause for, for hallelujah, you know, the, 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 the praise to the Lord. No, what happens is Satan offers him the kingdoms of this world at the wrong time. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the right thing at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. Because again, that whole drama of redeeming Adam's race out of sin and rebellion into the, they have to be translated into the kingdom of light before right. Christ forcibly takes the kingdoms of this world. Yeah, he he wants all three kingdoms, and he, he he'll yeah. take him his way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're taking territory. We're warriors for the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not a physical battle; it's a spiritual battle. And the way we take kingdom territory is one heart, one life at a time. Yeah. Okay, so there it is. In Ephesians 6, we have to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We wear the word of God so that we can stand against the enemy. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what do we do? Verse 13, we put on the word of God by faith. We put on the promises of God. And then... At the conclusion of putting on the armor of God, verse 18 shows us engage in warfare, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Pray for me. I need open doors and wisdom to walk through them the right way. So what do you have? It absolutely follows what you see in the book of Daniel. What's Mm -hmm. Daniel doing? He's praying to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And in response to his prayer, a battle is won, yeah. and it reshuffles the dominion board in terms of principalities and powers. The prince of Persia has to stand down, and the message goes forth, right. a message of victory and deliverance. And so I think nothing changes in that. Yeah. So there's, there's a battle for the hearts and the souls and the lives of the lost nations of this world, and we're on a search and rescue mission, and the only way we effectively take territory 
is through prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there has to be the obedience of wearing the armor of God, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But at the end of the day, God has to open the doors and he has to give us the victory. Nobody gets saved, but what we're praying for it, because yeah. Satan's not going to just let him go. Right. We have to, that strong man, Jesus says, has to be bound. So I can pray and uh, princes have to stand down <laughs> and then the gospel gets shared and they hear it for the first time. Yeah. Their eyes are opened. The God of this world can't blind them anymore. They, they, they hear the gospel. They hear it as the power of God unto salvation. And boom, we just stole another one right. <laughs> from yeah. the enemy. Yeah. You know? The national component is a future component. And uh, I think we're going to see that played out because um, there's, there's a, sh a sheep and goats judgment. Yeah. So God is going to deal with nations. He's, he's mm -hmm. not, it's not like he's ignoring that yeah, factor. Yeah, over their treatment. Of the Jew during right. the time of tribulation, right? Yeah. But like for, but for, that principle is there, yes. Right, but for yeah. like an amillennialist or like a postmillennial, someone someone that that doesn't see the the tribulation and the mm -hmm. millennial reign the way we do, yeah, they kind of conflate a lot of that stuff. And they'll mm -hmm. they'll the Great Commission is not the ethnos of people groups; mm -hmm. it's about nations. Mm -hmm. And so the way that God dealt with nations in the Old Testament, oh well, He's still doing things like that now, um, but. It's not that God is not working in, in in the national sense. It's just that His plan is is to deal with that at the end. Yeah, yeah, and yet, yeah, I hear you, and I think you're you're dead on. But at the same time, you kind of still see it even mm -hmm. on the national sense, or, or at least in terms of the, in terms of people groups, and you'll see a door, like even in terms of modern missions, there'll be some places and some peoples that are yeah. so hard right, right, right. against the gospel. They're so hard against the word of God and the person of God himself, you know, and then mm -hmm. you few countries over and it's like, you know, you open a Bible and it's just, I mean, it's like yeah. drawing flies to whatever they're into. Yeah, it's, day. it's just, yeah, yeah, it's just, I mean, <laughs> there's a, an effectual door is open yeah. with that people yeah. group. Yeah. And yeah. so all these dynamics are working simultaneously. Yeah. God's, yeah. God's yeah. playing chess. After the rapture, we'll We'll see and we'll know as we're known, and and uh, we'll have a lot more insight. But yeah, there's there's thrones, there's yeah. rulers, yeah, and they have authority, and stuff can't happen unless they permit it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they have to be forced to let stuff happen in their area of purview, mm -hmm. you know. So we need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, and principalities and powers have have to get out of the way in response to our faith in God's word, praying in faith, moving forward in faith. We yeah. take kingdom territory. And kind so of awesome. It's really awesome. You want to get to the judgment seat of Christ and find out that somehow, you know, you were praying with some little old granny and, and the Prince of Persia had to stand aside. <laughs> that would yeah, be it's pretty amazing thought. Pretty amazing thought. Yeah. So I think one of the the temptations would be, you know, this is really grand. Like what we're talking mm -hmm. about is really grand. It's really big. It covers millennia of human history. It's an yeah. overarching theme that goes beyond this. These things are invisible. It's happening when we can't even see it. Yeah. Uh, we war against it in prayer. Like it, it's very grand. Why, you know, wh why is the devil so concerned with individuals then? Like a single individual their decision making, their faith, their decision to pray has a consequence in this battle. And so uh, just in order for we've talked about kind of the macro, if we're getting yeah. down to the micro level, yeah, like why, why should I be why should I yeah. be so concerned about devils as yeah. a human being? Yeah, yeah like when, what why would Satan care that I come to Christ? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yet and yet he does, clearly. Yeah. I think the ultimate answer to the why is the, well the answer is is because he hates your guts mm -hmm. <laughs> like like Satan hates me with a perfect hatred uh, he would love to see me uh, destroyed and it seems like you know in terms of the the way most people without a biblical framework would view it is it's like God and Satan fighting for the adoration and worship of individuals there's a element or there's a layer where that that appears to be true okay God loves us. He wants the very best for us, and the very best for us is himself, mm -hmm. right? God is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, how do I worship him in spirit and in truth? It starts with the, 
the seed of the word of God. You know, I receive it. I believe on it. It affects, it produces the salvation and the life of God in me. And through this spiritual birth that takes place, I'm now baptized. I'm, I'm through the function of the spirit. I'm made part of the body of Christ. And now the spirit of Christ dwells in me. Well, why? Because God loves me. He was literally willing to lay down his life for me so that I could have it. So God's jealous God. He'll have no other gods before me. Why? Because him alone is what's best for me. Mm -hmm. Like he, he literally created us to be in fellowship with him, to be part of his family for eternity. And that was so important to him. He laid down his life to, to buy the, the path yeah. to reconciliation. Conversely, Satan, you know, according to Jesus in John 8, 44, he says, you're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. What is the activity that you're doing? Oh, yeah, he was a murderer from the beginning. Okay, so, so Satan wants people to follow his example of rebellion. What God's expecting is too much. So for him to justify his rebellion against the creator, um, you know, again, the, the battle, obviously, God, God, God lays out the terms of the battle in terms of how creation moves forward after his fall. Mm -hmm. The earth is restored, and on the sixth day, in terms of a stewardship over creation, right. he's literally replaced by the dirt that he ruled from. Right. Okay, God makes a dude out of the dirt he walked on. And uh, <laughs> that replaces the role of, of yeah, Lucifer. Uh, he's uh, the new steward. Yeah, he's the new steward. And, and so, you know... Um, is this idea of of a of a of a mud sun starts in the heart of Satan? Like we're not fit. He hates us. He hates everything about us. So if he can, if he can take what God created, that he already knows. I mean, Satan knows the Bible better than than we know it, mm -hmm. and he already knows that what God's going to redeem out of humanity is a bride for His Son. You know, He's going to redeem a people out of humanity that's going to go forward into eternity future as part of his household. And they will, like, particularly in terms of the church age, I mean, you think about us, we're yeah. literally called the sons of God. Like, yeah. like we have equal footing with a celestial host. Right. I mean, these guys are greater in power and might. Mm -hmm. and, and we get the title son of God with Adam, right. with a celestial host. Oh, yeah. You know, so it, from, a, from a spiritual perspective, it... I don't know. I don't even know how else to put it. I mean, it's on like Donkey Kong. Yeah. We have to be a failed proposition to justify Lucifer's rebellion because that's what's best for him. Yeah. And in the and in the response of that or in the aftermath of that, we don't have God in our life. We're eternally destroyed. He don't care. Right. He absolutely doesn't care. Yeah. He hates me. All he wants for me is to burn in hell for eternity. That would be his fondest wish is that we would be an utterly, humanity would be an utterly failed proposition before the Lord. Yeah. So, so I, think, I think that's super interesting because you're, you're painting really the psychology behind the devil's view of humanity. And, it, and I think what you said is really interesting because what started with Adam found its way through Noah and then to Abraham and then, and then the nation of Israel. So you have this group of people that are the, the sons and daughters of God. And then the, the, over time, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ comes on the scene, and it explodes. Now, no, now is it no longer associated with just a nation of people, but there are sons of God everywhere in every nation infiltrating His territory, and it becomes this explosion yeah. of of followers of Christ that are sons of God. It, it that I mean, talk about a huge blow. Well, it gets worse, right? What's worse is these born again what should have stayed sons of fallen Adam. Right. Now these born again sons of God are judging angels. Yeah. Yeah. They're judging the celestial host. Um, and you think about that. I mean, what would the ultimate culmination of that be? Us giving our amen to Lucifer's eternal consignment into a lake of fire. Oh yeah. He hates us. <laughs> and so that naturally, because yeah. as you mentioned before, yeah. the, the sheer number of devils at, Satan's disposal mm -hmm. uh, allows him the ability to affect the personal, the, the, the father of a home, 
who ministers in a local church or the woman on the street or the, the, the teenager who's dabbling with drugs for oh, the yeah. very first time. Yeah. And he has the ability because of his own resource yeah. to be involved at that minute of a yes. level. And so yeah. if he can, he will. As the God of this world, there is a mirror to the, it's not an equivalent. Uh, there's a shadow, right? There's a reflection of God in terms of his capacity to accomplish his will, which it's an infinite capacity. The Father's going to accomplish his will. But for Satan, I mean, he's got access to an innumerable company of rebellious stars, rebellious celestial angelic beings. Uh, he's got countless foot soldiers in terms of just lost humanity. Mm -hmm. And he's got countless devils at his disposal to work I mean, like you said, at any level of the life of a person to keep them in a place of rebellion against their creator. So much so, I mean, you think about the capacity that they have. You know, the Bible says that that Satan put it in Judas's heart. Uh, you know, that, that betrayal, the whole, Judas didn't come up with a scheme. Satan put it in yeah, his heart, you right. know? And so Satan has the ability to put thoughts, to put impulses, to put desires in your heart. You didn't come up with it. You did, it didn't actually originate with you. Right. But God's, God's actually, you know, that's not the problem in God's mind. The problem is whenever we side with him in it, yeah. whenever we own it with him. Pray. Yeah. 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 So th the next natural question for me would be one about, um, the difference between God's complicity in Satan's work and his allowance. So just for illustration, Job chapter one is a, mm -hmm. is a really good example uh, of this, of how this dynamic plays out. But because yeah. if God has the power to protect all of humanity at give, any given moment from, from temptation trial that the devil invites into our life, mm -hmm. a lot of people would say, well, why doesn't he do, why doesn't he do that? Like, why, is, why does God allow suffering in this world? Why does God allow me to be tempted? Why does he allow pain to come into my life? If he has the power over it, mm -hmm. um, why doesn't he just enact that power? And it comes back to this issue of, of what God allows versus what he um, is, is for in favor, puts a stamp of approval on. Um, can you explain that dynamic and even just the nature of, of how... Satan presents himself in the throne room of God and how there's an ongoing dialogue that's taking place. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's important because I think people yeah. despair over this thought yeah. and it, it affects their faith. Yeah, well, I mean, you actually set it up, explain it very well, just even in the asking of the question. You know, again, it goes back to, you know, that Isaiah 14 moment where creation rebels against, wants to stand in place of the creator as God. Satan wants to show himself as God. God takes that and makes that the line mm -hmm. for all of creation to choose them this day whom they will serve. Yeah. Well, again, when you look at the big picture of what's taking place, you know, particularly in this dispensation, because that's where the rubber meets the road for us. Right. You know, why is there suffering in our world? Right. <laughs> uh, why is there suffering in my life? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Christians are called the sons of God. And, and, and when you do the math, what's happening? You know, in the church age, God is redeeming from Adam's fallen race replacement sons of God. That innumerable, you know, God... God is in the restoration business. Mm -hmm. And so the loss of a third of his family, a third of his sons is not going to stand. That just like the earth had to be restored in Genesis chapter one, his, so also his family must be restored in Genesis chapter one. And, it, and it's like, you know, this question has been asked and answered a hundred times. And if not in this podcast, all, you know, everybody's heard the answer. It has to be a valid choice for people. Yeah, people have to be able to, yeah. People have to be able to exercise their free will and 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 choose them this day that the Lord Jehovah He is the God, not the devil. No, the God is Jehovah. Why does He allow it to happen? Well, with the allowance of free will comes the fallout of free will. But also with all of that, um, 
you can't miss the case that God makes. I mean, God has fallen all over himself to make sure that we can see that there is a path for rescue. There is a solution. You know, there's a lot of suffering that takes place because it's just a fallen world. Right. And this is why, I mean, you, God makes sure that we see his heart. I mean, he tells us to weep with those that weep because mm -hmm. everybody's going to run through a rough time. <laughs> we need to be able to just, like Job's friends sat with him for days, yeah. just yeah. grieving with him. Right. Um, you know, that's it's a fallen world. And, and so we have to have that capacity to represent God to people who are going through it. He's grieving. Nobody hates what's going on more than the Father does. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, free will has to play out. This fallen world will stay fall, fallen until it's restored. All of creation, the Bible says, is groaning. We're, it's like your dog is waiting for you to be manifest as a son of God. You yeah, know? Right. Creation's groaning for that day where everything is restored. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. We're going to pause right here for just a second so we can hear from one of our students from the Living Faith Bible Institute. My name is Havel Ginther. Uh, I'm a wife and mother of two little boys. I also teach as an adjunct professor at Longview Community College. And my main ministry here at Midtown Baptist Temple is the College and Young Adults class. So I serve as a counselor in that class and a discipler. Being an LFBI, the accountability of having uh, weekly quizzes and listening to the lectures initially uh, intimidated me and I felt like I wouldn't be able to manage that along with my other responsibilities, but I found that the accountability of it and the structure has helped me find balance in my home by having those small goals to meet every week. Um, it's a super manageable course load. I know all the big assignments in advance, and so I can start those at the beginning of the semester and work on them incrementally throughout the year. Visit lfbi.org to learn more about Living Faith Bible Institute. And now back to the show. You know, in terms of this interplay or this dialogue between Satan and God, um, you know, yeah. I mean, in Job's case, it's like, you know, here's the proof that you screwed up. <laughs> Even a guy made from dirt can get this right, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, in one sense, at one level, it's all to show Satan it's only right that he spends eternity in a lake of fire. There's one level or one sense where all of this is happening because of that. Uh, God doesn't, I mean, all God ever did was love Lucifer. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, that same, that same, um, that same data set demanding our decision, it plays out for each individual. In that sense, we're no different than Lucifer you know, where he chose rebellion, we have this unique opportunity to be able to choose, you know, to be able to make the decision. The Lord, he is the God, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, God, God has the capacity to take every, the free will decision of every person on this planet. And if we will love God and be called by his name, even that will be worked out for good in our life. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the pain, the suffering, all of those things took place in the life of the Lord, and he was perfected by it. Yeah. Uh, for us, I mean, that was the mark, that was the evidence of his maturity. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing's true for us, you know. Um, we, get to, we get to see the, the good, but also the bad and the ugly. And uh, God allows it in our life because it helps to, I mean, it brings us to the end of a life in this world and self-sufficiency, yeah. self-determination. The spirit of Antichrist, we realize there's no there's no future in that. That's a dead end. Right. And brings us to a place of absolute dependence on the person and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great, it's a great teacher. Right. You know? Th and it's, this and world, there's no hope in this world. Right. But Christ. And yeah. Paul Paul points out the fact that it's actually a privilege to suffer on his behalf. Oh yeah. Which oh. is a game changer, right? Yeah. Like to 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 be able to say that not only is it you know, because I think the, the natural perspective is to say, I'm suffering, woe is me, yeah. right? Yeah. But to flip that on its head and then to say, well, actually, yeah, it's, it's a easy joy. easy to see, but hard to embrace. Right, right, yeah, right. It's a joy. Yeah. So, okay, let's come back to this idea of the kind of the characters that play here. We mentioned the devil, the devils, and sp spirits. 
And man, we live in a world like with movies and with like all the horror movies and all mm-hmm. the different, uh, you know, manifestations of, you know, uh, spiritism in the world, mysticism, all these things at work mm-hmm. where, where <laughs> demonic activity has become sensationalized by pop culture. And so with that comes a lot of questions, like what is actually true and what's not? Uh, what is what is it about, you know, what of possession? What does that mean? Is that a thing? What of exorcism? Is that a thing? What, what in terms of allowance, if we're talking about what God allows and what he does not allow in terms of this warfare, what are the white lines in which the devil has to stay within? You know, so this is all part of a question that I think goes back to this idea of familiar spirits, right? What the Bible calls familiar spirits. What are they and what are these spirits allowed to do and not allowed to do? How do they work? How do they work? So what are these spirits? What are they allowed to do and not allowed to do? Uh, you know, so the demon, the evil spirit, uh, you can make a case for, again, an evil spirit to be these principalities, these spiritual entities that sided with Satan. Because Hebrews calls the celestial host, you know, these angels are, are ministering spirits, right? So you can make that case. That would be a classification. But then there's a category of evil spirit that sure looks disembodied, right? I mm-hmm. um, referenced uh, Matthew. Yeah, in Matthew chapter 12 verse 43 it says when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man he walketh so here's this demon possessed man that gets delivered from this demonic yeah spirit so he walketh through dry places the spirit does the spirit seeking rest and findeth none he can't find a place to hold him then he saith, I will return to my house. It's interesting. So he's viewing the guy that he was presumably cast out from, you know, that he left. And he calls him my house. Mm -hmm. So if you think about a house, you know, our tabernacle, we're clothed upon a tabernacle of flesh. But Paul told the church at Corinth, um, after this life in the flesh, we'll be clothed upon from above. Okay. Uh, In terms of eternity future, this mortal puts on immortality. Um, This corruptible puts on incorruption. Our vile bodies will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Okay, so he calls this guy that he was removed from, he calls him my house. Yeah, he's my dwelling place. Yeah, from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. It's nice there because he's not crazy anymore. Because he's deep in this right. you know? And so, hey, this is nice. So then he throws a rave. Verse 45 says, Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. So they live there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And so you've got a, a wicked spirit that's desiring to live in flesh, to live in a person. Right. Um, so what is an evil spirit in terms of a demon, um, a demon that wants to possess a person? Okay, so the, the best way that I know how to describe it, it would be like this. Um, you, you've never seen a cat try to climb into a dog and be a dog. Right. Because it has, it already has a, a body. body. Yeah. yeah. And so angels, to say that angels are demons that want to indwell people has never made any sense to me, especially when Paul tells the church at Corinth about celestial bodies. Yeah, they specifically they have, have celestial bodies, yeah. and they're they're a far greater weight and glory than our celestial our, our terrestrial bodies. Yeah. So so the difference between like the sun or even the moon to the earth in terms of celestial glory, there's no there's no comparison. Right. You know, you got beings of light versus beings of dirt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I think. I think they got a better, they got better digs, right? right? So why wouldn't, like, why would, why would Michael, Israel's prince, ever want to climb inside of me, right? And use me as a meat puppet? I mean, that's right. just that's just never made any sense to me. Mm-hmm. 
Especially when there's specific language being used in terms of there's a differentiation between spirits. Yeah. In these, yeah. Inst- especially yeah. in these yeah. kinds of yeah. instances. Yeah. And so, like in scripture, and it may be there, and I've just missed it, but I've never found like the passage or the or the phrase that was like the clue as to where these spirits come from. And so I remember as a young man in the faith, I'm learning the Bible for myself. Uh, I'm doing the math one day because I'm trying to I'm trying to figure this question out. And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, I know what happens to Lucifer in the end. I know what happens to the angels that follow him in the end. I know what happens to Old Testament saints. What happens to them after they die? I know what happens to Christians after they die. In other words, in every age of human history, and even with a celestial host, you've got an answer. But the Bible doesn't say boo about what happens to these cats from Genesis chapter 6, these yeah. human celestial hybrids, these right. Nephilim, these right. giants, mm-hmm. these tyrants. It doesn't say anything about what happens to them. And so as a young man, my what I postulated was you never see a squirrel try to climb into a dog. No. Because it has its own body. So also the celestial host but what if these celest- what if these these chimeric beings these the giants, giants from Genesis yeah. 6 what if they're doomed to roam the earth as evil spirits and they you know you think about i mean man yesterday you were you know 18 feet or 58 feet tall nobody ever jacked with you you were like you were a stud. Yeah. <laughs> you were a, you were, well, you were Hercules. That's who, I, that right. was literally your name. And, and you could accomplish wonders, you know, you could accomplish these mighty feats and, and, uh, you're, you're, oh yeah. What was it? I mean, uh, Hercules has to prove he's got a place among the gods, you know? So these Nephilim are proving that they've got a place among the deities. And I was, man, I was rolling, strong and big and fat and man it all came apart and and if i made it to the end i'd drown (laughs) right and now i'm stuck on the earth and i see these you know like a giant now is what six foot four right (laughs) you know six foot seven i mean a seven footer that's like off the charts that's nothing you know so you see all these puny humans uh live in their lives and oh yeah you hate them you were part of the generation that that Satan used to corrupt all flesh before the Lord, and now you're powerless. And so that was my postulation. Uh, that was what I supposed. At Which that is time. an amazing conclusion, by the way. Like the fact that you thought of that, because I, I always had that question too, but I, I didn't couldn't derive an answer or make a connection here. I think it, but I think it's a great like theoretically. I think it makes sense. What happens to the spirit? of a giant when they meet their end because they are in human flesh right they they these are half angel yeah half human beings like they were bad mamma jammers they were both celestial and terrestrial yeah. in some regard yeah and so what does the soul of that creature look like what yeah. is the spirit or the yeah. nature the composition yeah. of that it's a it's a freak thing and it's still pretty powerful right in and of itself right yeah so now it's roaming the earth yeah right yeah. What and what is in dry it, places? In dry places, looking for looking for a dwelling. Now, I think one of the yeah. points that you've made before in this is that so it's it's roaming through the dry places. It's looking for which the inverse of that is that it's looking for a habitation that's hydrated, yeah. right? And yeah. so, what happens when Christ drives out? Which, by the way, you're two thirds water. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when he drives yeah. out the 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 um, spirits from the the legion out of the yeah they they go yeah. into pigs Swine. Yeah. and then wh- wh- why do the pigs go drown themselves yeah. right like it's this yeah. like again they're seeking this yeah. hydration there's a there's a yeah. there's weird connections there yeah and even on that that's like a double whammy because now you know what the end game was they're going to torture these demoniacs their whole but the end go, the end game's to kill yeah you know it, because they're of their father, the devil, and the lust of their father, they will do. He was a murderer from the beginning to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what's written in their heart. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what's written in the heart of these evil spirits. So you think about it. There's a there's a first level of possession. You know, this this demon on the first level is like I'm back, right? <laughs> but where am I? 
what am I wearing? Something I hate. Yeah. I mean, at the core. So it's misery, torture. Like nobody gets demon possessed and then their whole world comes into focus and everything's great. Even the people who make packs, you know, they get a muse. Um, they get a, they get an inner spirit guy. They get, you know, it, it always starts so wonderfully and it always ends like yeah, and you're torture. crazy and yeah, yeah, you know, and it's, you, the voices are saying, kill yourself, murder your baby. You know, it's just horrible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's abuse. It yeah. always ends in an abusive right. relationship. It's never good, you know? Um, so yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know, um, like I could never, I could never say with authority or certainty that the book of Enoch is authoritative. Um, its origins are suspect. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, you, we actually, you know, it shows up too late in, in human, uh, uh, you know, in terms of scholarship history, in terms of um, you know, the, the history of, of written word, it, it shows up at a very late date, but it is a commentary on Genesis chapter six and, mm -hmm. and, uh, the Bible quotes the book of Enoch. I, I can't tell right. you a certainty that the book of Enoch is authoritative, but, but in that book, you have some, you know, some evidence for the theory and you got these celestial beings, they were called the watchers. There, so again, think principalities, powers, yeah. Yeah. princes of nations. These watchers decide that they're going to very much direct the affairs of men, and they're going to stand in the place of God as God and be deities. And so it's Jupiter and Zeus. And, okay, mm -hmm. so now they're cohabiting with the women, and they have giants, and they realize they messed up. They actually, according to the book of Enoch, they swear, you know, it's a solemn it's a solemn oath that they make with one another. They're going to bind themselves together in this pact of rebellion against the Lord. And they realize their goose is cooked because it's all unfolding. The giants are rampaging. And so anyway, they, they call up Enoch and they say, hey, would you go talk to God for us? Uh, we, want, we want forgiveness. We want mercy. We mm -hmm. want protection. And, and so they send Enoch to God and God asks about the washers and, and God's judgment um, in the book of Enoch is uh, you go back to the watchers and you tell them, I didn't give you wives uh, because you're spiritual ones. Your dwelling is in heaven and the giants, your offspring that have a body of flesh, they're going to be called evil spirits on the earth and the earth will be their dwelling because their evil spirits come out of their flesh uh, because from above they were created holy watchers with human women, right? And so evil spirits, they will be on the earth and spirits of evil ones, they will be called. And, and then it says the dwelling of the spirits in heaven is heaven, but the dwelling of the spirits on earth who were born in the earth is earth. And the spirits of the giants do wrong and are corrupt, attack, fight, and break on the earth and cause sorrow. They eat no food, do not thirst, and are not observed. These spirits will rise against the son of men and against women because they came out of them during, during the days of slaughter and destruction and the death mm -hmm. of the giants. Wherever the spirits have gone out from their bodies, their flesh will be destroyed before the judgment, and thus they will be destroyed until the day of the great consummation is accomplished upon the great age, upon the watch, watchers and the impious ones. And so, you know, the description there is, is these sons that you love so much, you're going to watch them die. And, and from their death, they will continue on this earth as evil spirits. And, and it goes on in the book of Enoch to say they'll trouble men, mm -hmm. which is exactly what evil yeah. spirits do. Now, again, it's you know, hypothesis, it's but it runs, par it runs parallel. But it absolutely corroborates the Genesis 6 account and gives an explanation for where these demons, right. these right. familiar spirits, these evil spirits come from. Okay. So I think yeah, that, yeah. that's as good a working theory as anything. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. But okay, so to get away from uh, maybe less away from the theoretical and more towards what we can see from scripture and what we see in maybe our own reality, what are those white lines? Uh, who who do these spirits possess? Yeah. What? How does that unfold? This is a big question because I'm sure that there are some Christians that are afraid mm -hmm. uh, of, of this issue. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people have a hard time maybe even recognizing uh, maybe 
possession in other people? When does it, what does it look like? How does it yeah. manifest itself? Yeah. How often does it manifest itself? These are questions that I think people have. You know, yeah. you watch Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> I didn't. But. And you're, I've watched it. And that's kind of stuff. It really. Did you get nightmares? I mean, I think I saw it when I was like, you know, when I was in art school. You have to watch all the like famous yeah. f- movies yeah. when you're in art school. Yeah. But it was, I didn't have any nightmares, but it was definitely freaky. Yeah. 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 So yeah. What are the limits? You know, so I think most Christians typically historically have viewed possession. They would equate demon possession with damn to hell, mm-hmm. right? If somebody's demon possessed, it's because they're damned to hell. And, and you won't see that correlation in scripture. I mean, Jesus came and set captives free, mm-hmm. you know, even before his 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 atoning death where he leads like ultimately captivity captive and right. frees Abraham's bosom, you know. Um, man, the demonized, when they came to Jesus, the demons were cast out of them. Right. You know, they were set back into their right mind and they were they were delivered. And so possession in the Bible is never equated with damnation. That's right. okay. that's never been the case, you know. But the logic typically goes like this, you know. A Christian, if they're saved, because I think that's really the, the question most people have. Most Christians don't have a problem with lost people being demonized. The question is, to what extent can a Christian be demonized? Mm-hmm. You know, and if we're if we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, well, then we should never be able to be troubled by an evil spirit on any level, much less to the extent that we're out of control, like the 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 evil entity has possession at a level where they're controlling your life in the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know I mean? Maybe we're not talking about your head just spun, you know, spun 360 degrees. (laughs) Right. And you projectile vomited. Right. (laughs) Now that's a movie I never saw. I saw that one. And uh, that gave me the heebie-jeebies. The Exorcist, when I was I've a kid. told, I've yeah, told everybody, I'm some. never watching that. It's <laughs> yeah. too much. It, it's worth it just for that scene. I mean, now it's probably you know the effects have come so far. They remade it. Probably wouldn't. I think they remade mess it with people with the new effects. Oh, they did. I think so. Yeah, I don't want to see it. No. Yeah. So you know, if we're saved, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, and He's called the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, right? right? So you think about in terms of the life of the believer, we're bought with a price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body. Right. <laughs> and yeah, the old, you know, the, the in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And But, sure. oh man, there's a down payment on yeah. the redemption of the purchased possession. Uh, we're what, possessed by a quickening spirit. Yes, and, yeah. and it will be manifest at the rapture. You know, this vile body will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Mm-hmm. And so my, my, you know, this is why I can't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, right? Because what concord does light have with, you know, what concord hath Christ with Belial? You know, light and darkness don't mix, you know? So <clears throat> what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? First Corinthians 6 16 says, we're the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Okay, so, you know, most people miss the rest of that passage, by the way, in Mm -hmm. in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, because there has always, on the part of the believer, there has to be volition. Mm -hmm. You have to decide, you agree with God. So like verse 17, wherefore... Because you are a purchased possession, because God himself now indwells the life of the believer, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Why? Why are we commanded to do that? Oh, yeah, because you can be unseparated and you can touch unclean things. (laughs) So we're commanded not to do that, you know, and I will receive you and I'll be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and my daughters. And so the logic is if we have the Holy Spirit, we can never be troubled or, 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 or for lack of a better way to phrase it, demon possessed Mm -hmm. by an evil spirit. And we think, okay, that just settles it because that's good sanctified logic. Um, well, okay. Like we talked about, you know, um, Enoch is quoted by Jude, whether or not we have an accurate version of that in terms of what's extant or not. I, I don't know, but, um, you know, 
Enoch prophesies in Jude 14, the seventh from Adam, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And according to what we have from Enoch, you've got giants expiring, and now evil spirits are unleashed on the earth. And and if we learned anything from Matthew, a disembodied spirit is looking to be embodied, and they don't care about the quality of life of the host. Mm -hmm. It always results. Jesus says it always results in misery and trouble yeah. for the one that's demonized. So then the question, then the question is, okay, I mean, really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where they can, come from. We just know from God's word that they exist. And they're looking to not just inhabit, but to make miserable the life of the person that they host. You know, one of the great themes of the Bible is the seed, right? Um, spiritual wickedness wants to possess, to corrupt the seed of the woman, and they want to use and destroy uh, the woman's offspring. Like the ultimate culmination would have been, is there a way to, to destroy the Messiah? Mm -hmm. You know? Okay, so in Luke chapter 9, here's a guy that, that comes to Jesus, and he wants mercy for his son. In Luke chapter 9, verse 39, he says, Lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly, and suddenly, he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. So he'd have these fits, and then there'd be a calm, and then there'd be fits, and there'd be a calm. And it's it's he's watching that it's killing his son. Mm. And so the can you deliver him? And they can't. And so Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil. Th so you know the end game just by the narrative here. The devil threw him down and tear him. Mm. He's like going for the kill. Yeah. But you know, this kid, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get kicked out. He dies. You know, the party's over. He dies. That's the spirit's attitude. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and delivered him again to his father. So there you see, you I mean, what a beautiful picture, right? Jesus is all about setting captives free, and yeah. he wants restoration to the father. We know from Scripture that we can be deceived by these spirits, 1 Timothy 4. Uh, this is why we're commanded. Like, this is to believers, right? Believers in 1 John chapter 4 are commanded to try the spirits, whether they be of God. Yeah. Okay, so right there you already know, as a believer, there are deceiving spirits that are working to get me to believe a lie. Yeah. That's a level, that's a classification of demonization that we have to be on guard against. Beloved, believe not every spirit. That means that means there are false spirits trying to sell you a bill of goods, right. and you better discern from the Word of God what's true and what's a lie, because right. the lies are coming. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, he goes on to tell you how to discern between the Spirit of Christ and Antichrist. Okay, so the thing that 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 gets me as a Christian that I know that we have to be on guard against uh, the ultimate clue is found in Ephesians four twenty seven. And Ephesians 4.27 is written to the church. It's the church at Ephesus. This is to believers. And the command is, neither give place to the devil. That's the command. Why? Well, because you can. Mm -hmm. And that word that's translated place means a room, a spot, quarter, license. Don't give him the latitude to operate in your life because you can. Yeah. So a believer can... like. The, prohib the prohibition is, is stated in such a way to guard against a believer presenting themselves acceptable by the devil. And so that's, that's the question on the floor mm -hmm. is can you give so much place to a devil, right? Can you give so much place to the devil that, that man, you're demonized to an extent that you look like you're crazy too, you know? Yeah. Like that's, the really, that's really the question. Well, you know— First, First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Uh, you know, that, to me, that's the principle. Anytime a believer refuses God's word, God's spirit, right? What God's spirit is saying, the spirit of God is saying in the word of God, uh, you're kind of fair game. 
to believe yeah. a lie. And to the extent that you believe and cooperate with a lie, well, that's the extent to which some lying, deceiving devil has the latitude and the ability to operate in your life. Yeah. There are deceiving spirits that want to, they want to have latitude. Yeah. They want to have access. They want to operate in your life. Why? Because to the extent that they can, well, that's the extent to which your life is mocking your redeemer. And, right. and so they'll take all they can get. So in the, we're going to do another episode in the, in the future here that on the show. Mm-hmm. We've already talked about it a little bit, <clears throat> where we address what it looks like when people do begin to give heed to seducing spirits. Like what, how does oh, that yeah. manifest itself in our contemporary culture and our world? We're going to, yeah. we're going to go after some of the it's things. It's on a rampage, man. It's, it's on epidemic. a epidemic. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, a sign yeah. of the end, right? Yeah. I mean, it's clearly, yeah. this is what it looks like yeah. when we approach the end yeah. of all things. Right? Oh yeah. We're at the end. We're, we're, at, we're in the end game. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So we're going to have an episode. It's at the boss level. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to have an episode yeah. devoted to that in the, in the near future. Uh, so we'll come back to those ideas, but, but I want to ask as we close, uh-huh. why is it that in the Christian world today that this theology is relegated to superstition? Like that, that, that Christians are trying to distance themselves from th- this theology, which is really uh, s- central to the whole narrative of scripture. Yeah. Right. Like there's a, there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to do away with the bad guy and the way he manifests himself because it, I I think maybe people feel like it, it looks bad on our faith or, or because it looks backwards. I don't, I don't know. Why do we see this? How is this a part of, how is this a part of Satan's plan? I guess. Yeah. So in terms of the spirit of this age, people want to deny the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Okay. The supernatural exists, man. I mean, by definition, our God is supernatural. Yeah. You know, he is the one who actually created the natural world. Right. He supersedes it. Yeah. The creation has, a, has his fingerprint, the uh, supernatural uh, fingerprint it, all over it. Yeah. I mean, he, and yet he is above and beyond it all. He is supernatural. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a supernatural God. It's a supernatural book. There's a supernatural battle taking place. There are sup- there is a supernatural component to faith that demands our attention. I mean, absolutely demands our attention. Okay, well, now if there is no supernatural, and if it's not a supernatural book, right? If it's just a book curating God's message to man, and it's got man's fingerprints, man's fingerprints all over it, now it doesn't have the same weight of authority that it did if every if it's a supernatural book. Mm-hmm. delivered to the apostles and the prophets by a supernatural God, man, I got to tremble before it. So what do I do? Oh, yeah, yeah, we discount all of that. Uh, you know, there aren't principalities in high places trying to hinder the work of the gospel, uh, uh, the kingdom of God, the gospel of God. You know, n- none of that, n- the stakes aren't high. Right. You live your life the best way that you can. You just be asleep right? Be, yeah. Just stay asleep in your cluelessness. And, and so I think, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a determination to deny the supernatural component of our relationship with the Lord, the supernatural stakes that are in play. And um, the reason why is if people don't see it at that level, well, then their guard's not up and they're ripe for the picking, mm-hmm. you know? In 2 uh, Timothy 2, you see people get off the battle and they start fighting other battles that end up not progressing the agenda that God has for Christians. And so Paul warns Timothy against it. He says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Mm-hmm. Who? Well, that blankety blank, no account godless lost you know rebellion rebel, rebel against god uh has has made his choice and and uh you know they made their bed they're going to lie in it and so i'm going to be justified in treating them like trash no be gentle unto all men right. apt to teach patient what does my posture need to be now in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves 
if peradventure God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him yeah. at his will. Satan is in the business of cap capturing people. Well, if people are on their guard, that's a lot harder to do. Yeah, there's so reason hunters them. hide traps. Yes, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a lion stays couched and crouched. They lie in wait in ambush. And then once they judge that it's too late, there's no escape, they spring, mm -hmm. you know, and they take them captive. So a, a hypervigilant population, well, that's hard to make a prey of, you yeah, know? And right. so I think, yeah, there's this, there's this idea of just downplaying everything. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a very secular scientific life. There's a rational explanation for everything. Science has all of the answers, even though it can't hardly answer Jack, but it has, well, you yeah, know, we're right. going to worship and submit to science and, and, uh, you know, we live in a rational world. There's no supernatural component to it. Right. And so you just stay dumb and clueless and careless and complacent because that makes you easy prey. Yeah. I yeah, think that's, that's why. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. Well, Sam, we've covered a lot of ground in this episode. And we are, we're going to come back. There's a lot to talk about in the future. And, and we'll, yeah. we'll have that episode. But thank you for introducing us to this topic and maybe clarifying some of the points that are, for a lot of people, difficult or complex or informed by the wrong sources. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for letting me. Yeah. yeah. And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of The Postscript. And uh, I hope today was good. I, hopefully it was intriguing. I mean, I think these kinds of topics people love to listen in on because they're just fascinating to hear about. But hopefully it was informative to you because you don't ultimately want to fall prey uh, to the wiles of the devil. You, you want to make sure that you are on guard, that you are prayerful, that you are waging battle. You know, a soldier with his sword drawn is uh, much, much more difficult for the enemy to take advantage of. And so you want to be you want to be that person. Now, if you're looking for a way to get equipped, uh, we want to invite you to be a part of the Living Faith Bible Institute. Um, maybe you're a part of a local church uh, that uh, that you are involved in, and, and you love ministry, you love the Lord. You want to find ways to lead. You want to grow in your knowledge of God's Word. We want to invite you to check out lfbi.org, learn about who we are. Uh, check out our program of study. It's $40 a credit hour uh, to get an Associates of Divinity through Living Faith Bible Institute. And we offer classes that address, address so many different things, both in ministry, but also in theology and how to study God's Word. We want to equip you so that you can be everything that you need to be in the context of your church, wherever that is in the world. And so we love you. And uh, we are for you and we are, we want to walk with you and we want to equip you to be who God's made you to be so you can live out the mission. Visit lfbi.org to learn more about that. If you enjoyed this episode, share it, subscribe, write a review. Uh, we're grateful for you every time that you hang out with us and we will see you again next week, next Monday for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.